So you've done your two years national service. What was next? Exactly. Well, I didn't know what I was going to do when I came out of the army, but in 1957, I went in the army in 1956, so I was due to come out at the beginning of 1958. And in 1957, on one of my regular visits to the Empire Newcastle, I went to see a bill with the, the Squadroneurs Orchestra. They were top of the bill. And on the bill was a young comic called Des O'Connor. And you'll see from the poster that he was quite near the bottom of the bill. But I thought he was great. He was a young, modern comic. And I collared him coming out the stage door, and he was very kind. He stopped and he spoke to me and <laughs> get in the show business. He said, well, do what I did. I said, what did you do? He said, I went to Butlins and became a redcoat. I said, is it easy to get in? He said, well, he said, bluff your way in. And that's what I did. I went, as soon as I came out of the army, I wrote to Butlins in Oxford Street, London. I got a reply and I went for an interview in April of, of uh, 1958. I got the job and I started in May at Skegness. My act then, the act I was starting to do, was sleight of hand. Not that I was very good at it, but it got me into walking on the stage and being able to talk to an audience because I would be doing something with my hands. I may have some billiard balls and uh, little ones and I would uh, you know, make them appear and disappear and thimbles and things. Uh, and cigarettes, I used to manipulate cigarettes and make them disappear and come out of thin air and things. Um, but it was a means to an end because it got me on the stage and it got me over that fear of doing the first joke, which is every comic's fear. You know, you're going to get across in that first few minutes. And I did a little audition for them um, before to get the job. And when I went, they made me a tombola caller, calling the bingo. And, and they used to have the bingo at Skegness in the boxing ring. There, you could get a book you couldn't win money you could only win prizes you used to win vouchers which you had to spend in the shops but that's when i started as a bingo caller uh, and the comic on the camp was the the camp comic was uh, a fella called dave omani who became dave allen and he was the top comic in the redcoat show and believe me he worked nothing like we remember him yeah. he used to do a crazy sort of jerry lewis type comedy act it wasn't until he went over to Australia and became a talk show host and a big star in Australia, did a late night show. Then he came back to Britain and made his name back over here, of course. But um, we, we remained very close pals until he died, bless him. What was the uh, audience like? So it'd be younger families at Butlins or oh, yes. how, how mean, different to being on a stage, for example? Oh, it's just fabulous. I mean, it really what I really wanted to do. I mean, I was working on the stage calling the numbers and doing the bingo. That was talking to an audience, which was great. But then I got a chance to go on the big stage in the Redcoat show, but I wasn't allowed to talk. I did a silent magic act. It was my own fault for doing it at the audition, really. So I did this silent magic act, which was billiard balls and symbols, dressed as a Chinaman. But that was my first season at Butlins as a, as a bingo caller. And then, of course, in the winter, I was out of work. So I had to go and work the clubs. So I got experience working in the clubs, mainly around Newcastle, because I had a girlfriend in Newcastle. Uh, and so I'd, well, I'd met when I was in the army um, and we eventually got married in 1961. But um, so I'd, I would go back to Newcastle, had a little flat up there uh, and work the clubs virtually, doing either these go as you pleases. And sometimes I would get engagements from them where I would be able to go back at the weekend and do a do a, a spot and get paid for it, you know. But I didn't always get paid. Sometimes I got paid off. And paid being paid off is the worst thing. It means you're not very good. One particular instance I remember was at a club and I was with this little show group. We had a, a, a lady drummer. We had a, a, a girl singer. We had a Scottish tenor called Paul Baker. He wasn't really Scottish, but he lived with a Scottish girl, so he developed a Scottish accent, so he didn't look out of place. And he would sing <laughs> Scottish songs in a kilt. And uh, we went to this club, and we did the first half, and poor Nicky set her drums up, bless her, to play for us. Uh, and we had a pianist as well. She wasn't very good either. In fact, we were all a bit poor. In the interval, the concert chairman came up and he said to me, 
we were changing in this billiard room upstairs. He said, uh, the committee have said, uh, I've got to peel you off in his Geordie accent. So I said, oh, okay. We hadn't gone down well. So he gave us half the money. Now, it wasn't, that wasn't the bad thing about it. The worst thing about it was having to walk back out across the stage and through the club to get out because that was the only way out was through the front of the club. And we went back to the bus stop, Nicky with her drums, Percy with his kilt, and standing at the bus stop. And they were coming out of the club then, the people going saying, well, I didn't think you were that bad. <laughs> Terrible. But anyway, all, all part of life's wonderful experience. You see, you have to fail. You have to fail. Whatever you do in life, you have to learn how to fail. Because unless you learn how to fail, you know, you won't really learn anything. Because it's the failing that teaches you in life what, what you ought to be doing and what you ought not to do.